5G sounds important. It is. Good tell observation. Me, tell me a little bit about Verizon's uh, broader strategy as it relates to 5G near term and long term. Yeah, so I think what you're seeing now is, is really a remarkable technical evolution that's occurring in the industry. And what we've been driving literally since 2015, believe it or not, is an advancement of a set of capabilities that the network can provide to consumers, enterprise, small business uh, alike uh, that, that is truly transformational. So a transformational experience from today's highly advanced 4G LTE networks. And probably the best way to think about what 5G can bring to the table uh, is in the form of currencies. Um, so for an operator, it's a way to monetize network capabilities that are largely defined within the, the standards already. So whether it's you know, raw throughput on a device, uh, whether it's the ability to accommodate significantly more connections today on a, a per square kilometer basis, whether it's low latency services that are going to be put in the market, service provisioning timeframes, energy efficiency, the list goes on. The currencies there are ways to monetize the network further and bring truly transformational experiences to the consumers at the other end of the line. Well, let's, uh, let's go into those currencies. If I recall Mr. Vestberg's CES yes. keynote correctly, there's eight of them. So maybe you can... Uh walk us through those and I won't keep count. Yeah, yeah, it's good, good. Um, and, and they are based on network capabilities that are largely defined today. So the starting point for them is actually fairly mature. While the network deployments are new um, and, and, and off to the races, as you can see from our results in places like Chicago and Minneapolis, um, the currencies are defined by true network capabilities. Um, so starting with throughput, um, the promise of 5G is really a, a, a throughput experience up to 10 gigabits per second when you have the right amount of bandwidth deployed. Um, you know, today you're measuring in, in megabits per second. We're already seeing uh, in our Chicago market gigabit plus speeds on a smartphone. So um, that's currency number one. Uh, the second one is the bandwidth that can then accommodate connections like that. So being able to accommodate significantly more users on a per square kilometer basis and provide that type of experience to more people. Um, 5G will help deliver that. Uh, third one is, is low latency. And, and this gets really exciting when you combine your 5G radio access network with your multi-access edge compute framework, uh, which is a really key component to provide low latency services. For example, in a use case like virtual reality, where you want to ensure your round trip latency is less than 20 milliseconds, Part of that you solve with a new 5G air link, part of that you solve with an edge compute framework that puts that processing closer to the customer. So low latency becomes one of those key commodities uh, that, you know, that we can trade on. Um, we see a lot of activity in high speed mobility. Uh, so today's LTE networks are somewhat bound by how fast the end device can go. But in the context of drones and high speed trains, um, 5G enables significantly faster end device speed, raw speed, uh, ground speed, if you will, or airspeed on the network. So that handoff mechanisms between sectors and sites in the context of 5G is designed for high speed mobility like that. Okay. We talk about service deployment timeframes and probably a key feature within 5G that you'll want to focus on is the concept of network slicing. And when you have a virtualized network framework, uh, you can actually slice the network in real time to provide different types of use cases in a highly efficient way for the operator and an optimized way for the end user. That allows us to shorten service delivery for new features and services on the network significantly. Um, and that puts, certainly from an enterprise perspective, um, it allows for a very agile framework to deliver new products to them. Um, a lot of focus also on energy efficiency. So, um, part of being a responsible business is finding new ways to, to really not only help the environment with a more mature manufacturing cycle, um, but also creating products that have higher energy efficiency ratios compared to 4G. And we already see that uh, in some of the early prototype devices. Um, I probably missed one in that equation, but yeah. um, you know, the, the, the last thing we see there is when, when you look at the intersection of 4G and 5G in the context of IoT, a lot of people today talk about, well, IoT needs 5G to be meaningful. That actually couldn't be further from the truth. In fact, when you look at LT networks and their capability to provide CAT-M functionality, narrowband IoT functionality, right, that is going to meet the needs of IoT use cases for the foreseeable future. Where it intersects with 5G, though, is when you have a pervasively connected society where you're trying to accommodate, say, a million connected devices per square kilometer. 
that's the last currency that I'd, I'd highlight there. And, and that bandwidth that's available on the network in the context of IoT, a few years down the road as society kind of evolves its IoT framework, um, but that's where those functions will intersect with 5G. So you mentioned uh, what's going on in your Chicago and Minneapolis markets. Uh, you know, the speed tests are remarkable. I saw some that were getting up close to a gig and a half down. Yep. Uh, but you mentioned kind of this long-term vision, 10 gigs, and then there's the IoT component, the network slicing component. So how do we get from where we are today to realizing this broader vision and unlocking that massive potential that's, that's there? You know, a lot of it is raw deployment. So when we look at our, our, our partners at this conference, um, you know, all of you have done a phenomenal job evolving with the technology to put uh, more effective solutions into the market. And, on behalf of Verizon, I can't say thanks enough for the partnership we have with, with most of this room and the conference floor um, to, to really, truly transform the network experience uh, across the board for our customers, and you're a big part of that. Um, what we focus on today is twofold in the sense that we've, you've got a really an award-winning LTE network that is best in class and meeting a, you're providing a phenomenal experience to over 98% of the population of the United States. So the thing you have to ensure on day one for us is as we roll out our 5G networks, we want to ensure a very seamless experience between 4G and 5G for the consumer. Um, continue to meet the broadband needs as, as the network evolves and the consumer experience shifts. The next piece of that equation, though, is, is really finding where the traffic is, where the customer experiences need to be, and then putting the bandwidth into the market to accommodate that. So certainly a 10 gigabit per second you know, target in the context of 5G is years down the road, but just start with the gig, gig and a half connections that you're seeing today. Um, using Chicago as an example, we've started that deployment with only 400 megahertz of bandwidth in service. And we have 800 megahertz of 28 gigahertz spectrum at our disposal. So on day one, with a high-end, you know, best-in-class device from Samsung, we're providing a gigabit plus speeds on day one. So we see a pretty clear you know, line to the end of that. A lot of work to do, obviously. Um, but from a technical perspective, we couldn't be more encouraged by the advancements we're already seeing as these networks are deployed. So you know, we've, we've talked a little bit about wireless, but you, know, you can't have wireless without wires. I, I know you all are investing heavily in fiber construction right now. So maybe you could just give us kind of an update on where you are in the markets where you're building out. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so we've uh, made a conscious effort to really pair our wireless engineering with a fiber engineering process. And what that's allowed us to do is pursue over 60 markets around the country where we're going to actually be building fiber into the, into the footprint um, and, and you know, truthfully serving our own needs, if you will, from a front hall and back hall perspective. That's a very integrated engineering process that creates tremendous synergy on our end and allows for very rapid deployment in the municipality where we have strong partnerships. And from there, uh, that fiber plant actually allows us to serve multiple use cases. So not only do we have our own front hall and back hall needs, but we have small and medium business opportunities, we have enterprise opportunities, we have wholesale opportunities that come along with it. So that fiber plant, uh, as you mentioned, is a vital part of the overall wireless network. And using our fiber deployments in those markets has already proven to be extremely beneficial from a cost standpoint. Um, but also create a tremendous amount of energy engineering synergy, which we then use for rapid deployments. So, you know, you mentioned that you've got a lot of work to do, but you've got Chicago and Minneapolis up. I think you've announced 20 some odd other markets that are going to be coming second half of this year. But what's the, the pathway towards nationwide coverage? Yeah, so a couple things there. Um, yeah, we, we've named 20 plus markets. Uh, we have 30 plus on the docket, if you will, for 2019. So you'll see a steady, a, steady, a steady stream of market launches throughout the year. And a couple things that are going to come to bear uh, over the next year or so is you're starting, you're starting to uh, see a uh, feature called dynamic spectrum sharing uh, that will be applied to the network that allows an operator to use existing bands of spectrum for 5G services. And you know, our focus right now is on millimeter wave deployments in our high traffic areas. Our urban centers take more traffic than any other part of our network. Um, so we're highly focused on putting that capacity into the ground there. But later, as use cases emerge that require some type of national coverage, we feel we'll have an opportunity to use existing bands of spectrum to accommodate that need. In fact, dynamic spectrum sharing as a feature is largely defined within 3GPP, something we're already working with in our labs to, to uh, prove out. And we're encouraged by what we've seen so far. Um, 
that'll be a good way to meet whatever those coverage use cases may emerge in the context of 5G uh, and our capabilities. Yeah, so let's talk a little bit more about spectrum. Obviously, millimeter wave and adding that component carrier is giving you these really high speeds, but uh, there's been a ton of conversation here at ConnectX around CBRS and the mm -hmm. opportunities yep. that that presents. So uh, maybe you can give us a little insight into Verizon's strategy around 3.5 and shared access to that band. Yeah, we, you know, this is another scenario where we've been extremely pleased with how fast the FCC has acted. Um, go back to their Spectrum Frontiers order, which brought all this millimeter wave spectrum to market and is becoming highly effective. Um, CBRS actually started as a, a creative way for them to take really underutilized bandwidth and put it into the hands of, of uh, operators in the industry, really, for use. Um, it's a fairly unique spectrum in the sense that there's a sharing mechanism associated with it that is, uh, um, it needs to work extremely well. And we're confident the FCC will wrap up their certification of the SaaS providers uh, shortly so that that spectrum can be brought to market and put to use. Uh, but it creates a really good opportunity to use um, a healthy chunk of 3.5 gigahertz spectrum in concert with your license bands of spectrum to provide additional capacity and therefore better performance for the end user. There are some, you know, there are certainly power limitations on the 3.5 gigahertz spectrum, which limit its use cases to you know, in-building and, and very low and tight outdoor small cell applications. Um, but as a mechanism to bring underutilized spectrum to market, it's a phenomenal solution, and we really actually applaud the FCC's creativity on that front. Um, we're anxiously awaiting the approval of the DAS uh, or the SAS uh, certification mechanism so we can get off to the races there. All right. You know, to go back to 5G, it, it really takes a village to, to develop this. Mm -hmm. And I know you all have done a lot of work to put together an ecosystem of stakeholders, which you know, seems particularly important as you mm -hmm. try to take that into very vertically tailored applications. But can you just tell us a little bit about what you've been doing to develop that ecosystem and, and what your end goal here is? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, the, the partnership that we've received from the industry and going as far back again in 2015 when we started the, the 5G technology forum has been, been remarkable. Um, I, I think most of us will acknowledge that we have, we have a lot of unknowns, we have a lot of knowns in the process, um, but the progress we've seen to date on crafting solutions that can meet a very wide range of use cases has been phenomenal. Um, we've actually really been encouraged recently by the participation from the enterprise sector. Um, if you take your traditional enterprise verticals that, where we provide wireless solutions today, uh, there's a section of those that can be enhanced by 5G, then there's a whole nother section of use cases that physically can't be met by 4G today and can be created by 5G. We spend a lot of time right now talking about uh, industrial automation uh, in, the terms, in, you know, in terms of robotics for, for enterprise solutions. And those are emerging very, very rapidly as really a sweet spot for 5G because deploying a location-specific solution to meet an enterprise use case is a fairly light lift. And, and then we see innovation that occurs on top of that once that type of connectivity is put in the hands of the enterprise, that's gonna be truly fantastic. So that ecosystem is evolving as rapidly, if you will, as the technical sector that's coming along with it. You know, you, you mentioned robotics there. Uh, I'm curious as you really refine your approach to vertical enablement with 5G, what do you see as the early targets? And then what do you think might need to wait for the enhancements that we'll see with release 16 to really prove meaningful to the end user? What, what we're already seeing, and this is probably a little bit different than what we've, we've seen in the past with traditional kind of 3GPP based releases, is our ability to upgrade software on the device and the network in real time is like it's never been before. And you know, I, I think even if you, if you look back, we had historically been focused on having you know, an end experience that was fully defined, bulletproof from, from day one. And the emergence of cloud computing on telecommunications networks and agile framework for software upgrades on both the device and the network has allowed us to be a lot more aggressive uh, with what we put in the market um, and, and then constantly refine, optimize, and improve. And to give you a really near, near example, both in Chicago and Minneapolis, we're putting software upgrades on the network basically every other day to improve the experience for the consumer, take advantage of new features that our partners are developing. 
And the 3GPP framework, while it is kind of monolithically release planned, those releases are massive. So through that cycle, you see constant availability of features that can be applied to your network through an agile framework that our technical partners then develop and deploy. And that happens pretty much in real time. Um, so, so that has evolved significantly from just three, four years ago and allows us to bring new features, new products, new solutions to market a lot faster than we ever have been. And Adam, you talked a, a couple weeks ago at the Moffat Nathanson conference at pretty good length about 5G home, but uh, I did want to get just a bit of an update because I, I think there's a lot coming up in the second half of this year around that fixed wireless service, right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and for those that uh, maybe haven't followed, our, our 5G home deployments today were four markets in the, around the country that are based on our 5G tech forum specification. And for clarity, that's a small subset of the overall 3GPP, 5G, and our specs. It does fixed wireless only, does 28 gigahertz only, does 400 megahertz of bandwidth only, right? So um, with a kind of a finite shelf life in the sense that we've manufactured only a certain amount of equipment and only a certain amount of devices, uh, really paves the way for a lot of learnings on our end. And what we focused on there is in a 5G home scenario where you're doing, you know, really point to multi-point, and the multi-point being the end user devices in the home, how well does it work? How easy is it to install? Um, how likely is self-install? And what we found through those launches is actually extremely encouraging in the context of reliability of the 5G AirLink for high bandwidth in-home services, uh, the installation times have decreased dramatic, dramatically. Um, we ex actually expect the bulk of our 5G home installations to be self-install when we rel relaunch the project in the second half of the year. Uh, so we use those four market launches, while they're based on a proprietary technology, to really inform our larger market launch plans in the context of, of 5G home for broadband services. Uh, combine that with work we're doing in our 5G labs around the country, and we're seeing a tremendous amount of innovation on products that can be put into customers' hands to enhance that experience. Things like window cling antennas um, are proving to be extremely effective for getting through things like low E glass, which, as we know, is really not a great uh, conduit for a 28 gigahertz spectrum. That's a known engineering challenge, and we've already got products that solve that. So we tried to cover a lot of ground here in the time allotted, but we're getting towards the end of it. So maybe just any final thoughts you'd like to share with the audience here at ConnectX? Yeah, you know, the thing that I see in, in doing shows like this is that the passion around this technology advancement is tangible. We see the same thing within our engineering core. Um, we, I feel we have the best engineers and technicians staff on the planet. And when we take scenarios like this where we've got a transformative network technology and we lay it out in front of them and then ask them to go innovate on top of it, that's when they really show um, you know, how creative they are and how such incredible engineering that occurs. We see the same thing in the industry. And, and this room and the show floor is an extension of our engineering staff in the sense that we rely heavily on the innovation that comes out of our technical partners to move this landscape forward and change the customer experience on our network. So, you know, just from a gratitude standpoint, uh, I extend all of it to our, our partners in the room. Um, and it's, it's a really, really exciting time in the industry as we see this incredible advancement in short order on top of what's already a phenomenal communications infrastructure. So really good time. Well, Adam, I really appreciate you taking the time to sit down yeah, with me. Yeah, this is great. Thanks, Ron. I appreciate it. All right, let's have a round of applause for Adam, please.